Cursed by the old gods in Bethany, we are five immortals doomed to walk the earth until we complete our thousand and one tasks. Due to being very noisy that night, and some of us were straight up not listening, we are not sure what thousand and one task we are supposed to accomplish. Luckily, we found these convenient books that could help us with our goal. After centuries of dicking around, we are ready to complete our destiny and die. We are, for now, the Immortals. And this is episode five. Yay! Woo! Episode five. Officially more than a month. Yeah! yeah. Look at us. Look at us. Yes. That's right. Yes. It is, it's little things. We've been alive for centuries and centuries, but when we actually get past a month, it's still a nice little victory. Every second seems like a year, like the older you get. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? It does. This is an yeah. internal hell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm having a really horrible life right now. What's your name again? Adam. I'm Adam. Hi, Adam. Hello, listeners. All of you. <laughs> My name's Austin. I'm Sarah. I'm Lee. And I'm Pedro. And welcome to The Immortals, where every week we review the a random number... To, that coordinates with the 1001 movies, foods, TV shows, classical recordings, and albums that you must hear before you die. Here in episode 5, we are going to review the 868th ones. And this week, that includes Hoop Dreams as the movie. Lee, what's the album? The album is This Is Hardcore by Pulp. Uh, the food is, and I believe I'm pronouncing this right, Pasia Slepa. Which is Finnish Easter bread. The TV show is going to be Arne Dahl. Uh, the book is Just Who Does This Child Take After? And the classical recording is The Duenna by Roberto Gerhardt. Fantastic. Are you guys ready to, to get into it? Are sure. Just, yeah. Let's yeah. jump right in, Austin. Let's jump right in. Jump in. Uh-huh. Uh, speaking of jumping, basketball. Whoa! That was seamless. Yeah. Did you just mm. alligate with your own transition? <laughs> Basketball. Yeah. That transition was a slam dunk. Uh, <laughs> Sarah, do you know any basketball terms? No. I know very little about basketball. Do you know anything about hinges? I know a lot about hinges. Then let's do a hinge fact before we get in. Okay, okay, okay. So hinges are distinguished from other circles of weird rocks by the fact that there is a, a mound or ditch on the inside of them rather than the outside of them suggesting they were not used for defensive purposes. So if you have your weird circle that's like a weird little town, and you got your big ramparts on the outside, that's like, oh, that's not a hinge, that's just a town. But if the ramparts are on the inside, then it's like, what are those ramparts doing in there? It can't be for defense, it must be for spooky mystical stuff. That's my hinge fact. Or could it have been used for basketball? I don't think so. You had one good (laughs) I keep wanting to, to... Sing the Space Jam theme song. Like, it's a real problem that no. I have. No. Everybody get up. It's time to we slam can't mute now. It. We're all using one We're mic. We're a real jam <laughs> going now. Welcome to the Space Jam. Your eyes are horrified. Right Do now. your dance. Take <laughs> yeah. your chance at the Space Jam. We don't have the couple Come for on. This. this is terrifying. I know all the words. <laughs> I could keep going. Why do you know all the words? Why wouldn't I know all the words? I'm impressed that she knows all the words. It's really That's important. True. Space Jam is not on the list of the thousand movies you must see before you Which die. Which is an oversight. I'm Which sorry. is a huge oversight. <laughs> is it? That movie's amazing. Oh, I think we just gave it honorable mention, right? Yeah. Better than Hoop Dreams. <laughs> Controversial <laughs> statement. Discuss. Oh my god. All right. We've already started off poorly. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's get into this segment before worse things happen. Uh, the movie we're discussing this week is, in fact, Hoop Dreams. This is a 1994 documentary directed by Steve James that was filmed over five years covering the life of two young boys in Chicago as they dream for NBA stardom. We watched from the very beginning, recruited to a private high school known for its very good basketball, and then the film covers them throughout five years of their entire high school careers and all of the dramatic things that happened to them and their families throughout the, this time. This is one of the most acclaimed documentaries of recent years. It is one that Roger Ebert called the best film of the 90s, so that's the one. Yes, that's the one. Okay. And it is often talked about as one of the best sports movies ever. But what did we think of it? What did we immortals think of Hoop Dreams? Well, clearly we don't agree that it's the best sports movie ever. Because there's always the Space Jam. Because there's Space yeah. Jam. Space mm. Jam is pretty amazing. Um, but it is, I mean, it's incredible. The, just even the sheer fact that 
that they chose these kids. I think you said, did you say that it was originally supposed to be just like an hour and a, a this half This was hour? to be a 30-minute documentary for PBS. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah, and so the fact that they kept going with these kids and it turned it out to be just such an incredible story is a feat in itself, I think. It was, it was amazing how much they kept going because they just kept requiring more grants and more funding, mm-hmm. a lot from PBS and a lot from this great production company here in Chicago to really... People kept seeing that there was something very special going on here and just kept coming back, kept coming back to get this full story. And yeah, so I, was it a lot of you guys' first time watching this film? It was my... Yeah. I had watched it, I think, maybe in pieces back in high school, um, but hadn't really uh, hadn't really dove in. But it's something that... So one perspective I had that was kind of fun is I actually live um, on the west side of Chicago... I mean, work. I work with kids who are a lot like Arthur and William, and actually, a lot of my kids who I work with, I, I'm a, I, I, I go to Marshall High School. So, what's been cool is that ever since I started working and living out there, Hoop Dreams, the movie, still looms large over the whole West Side. Everybody knows about Marshall's basketball team, both because Marshall's back basketball team is still pretty good, and be, but be, also because of this movie. Um, and so that's sort of a fun, so it's always been something that ever since I started living on the West side, it's been like, oh, I really should watch Hoop Dreams. Um, I think my perspective on it, because of where I work, um, and who I work with, I, I spend a lot of time with kids who are, like I said, a lot like Arthur and William. Um, maybe I, maybe a lot of it for me, and this might just be personal, was sort of old news. So full disclosure, I'm not a big sports person. Um, I like sports fine, but basketball shots, just like basketball footage isn't going to do it for me. And a lot of the drama about their families, though fascinating, was frankly pretty run-of-the-mill for the kind of neighborhood they lived in and the kind of situation that they were coming from. And as a result, I I guess for me personally, it didn't feel very... I don't know. For me, it felt a little long. Um, And, and like, it uh, it dragged a little for me. Um, But again, that might just be because it's a story that I know, because I know so many people who live a very similar story. So it's kind of like watching a documentary about, like, I don't know, a a life that's very similar to yours. You're like, yes, this is really dramatic, and I see it a lot. Had the same problem with Highlander. (laughs) (laughs) Lee and Pedro, what did you guys think? Um, I kind of agree with Sarah. Um, I used to live in in a not-nice neighborhood where... My next door neighbors were three girls who were very, all very, very talented at basketball, and they all dreamed of playing in the WNBA one day. And like, I think one of them maybe graduated from high school, maybe two, but they all had kids, and it was it followed a very similar path that this story did. So it was it was very reminiscent, but because it still kind of like it hit that close to home nerve for me it was like okay yeah this is still an issue this is still a problem we need to deal we need to deal with it some way so i think it spoke a lot to me i enjoyed it the narrator was could be oh my better. god Mom, no, yeah no. that that narrator was bad he sounds like ben stein like i actually yeah. kind of <laughs> thought he might be ben stein <laughs> it was very much a pbs narrator yeah let's see for me i i like this movie a lot um, I do not have the sort of pre-exposure that Lee and Sarah do did, um, but I, I also not a big sports fan. Um, I just liked seeing how different two people from a similar background, how different they can grow up or their circumstances can turn out just from something as small as one very nice lady. Um, So I don't want to give too much away from the movie, but these two guys start out in the same place, basically. And eventually one of them was really fortunate and the other one not so fortunate. And seeing how that affected both of their lives was a big, I think a big, not wake up call because you always kind of know that things like this are going on, but to be able to see it documented the way it was was something that I really liked and kind of spoke to me. Um, and yeah, just I think more for sh- basically showing what Lee and Sarah know so well already and making it more clear or open to the public, I 
that is why I like the movie. It's something that's really incredible with this is that it works very well as a look at this kind of life while also it is something that works as a sports narrative because in all the really good sports films, Mm -hmm. it is about the struggle of the athletes, not necessarily the winning the big game. Yeah. It is about the other kind of conflicts. And while there are really effective scenes to me of them up against the big game or up against that pressure, what didn't really work for me in this context, being a documentary and having the time to be with these kids for so long that you have a really good understanding of them and their families it really had a new dimension. So when you have, um, when you have William at the, the shot clock and he has to make the free throws and win the game, what I kept thinking about was, I also didn't really care who won the game. All I kept thinking about was just the intense pressure you're putting on this teenager. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's like all thinking. the scenes where he's in the doctor with the knee surgery where William is. Oh my gosh. Like that was heartbreaking. Like this is a 16, mm-hmm. 17 year old kid who's going under like, fairly large reconstructive knee surgery at such a young age and like this could end his career like, and, period. Yeah. And, and there is that feeling um, of you know ending his career is ending his life which I yeah. think is the thing that is really striking about the whole mm-hmm. I mean the idea that this is the only way out um, yeah. now I, uh, I kind of want to enter a spoiler zone only because I think it's really cool which is that I looked up what happened to these kids yeah me too after oh, yeah. yep. they and it's very interesting um they so they both did eventually play uh college basketball um why mm-hmm. they and which is discussed in the film yes but they did but neither of them went to the nba mm-hmm. um and it's interesting because uh the uh arthur the the player who is at marshall high school public high school Seems to be doing fine, um, but sort of has found his own business, and it was hard to find to find much information about how successful he is. Hmm. Whereas the kid who went to the private high school has much more of a traditional. He's a preacher now, much more of a traditional, clearly successful path where he has sort of gotten out. And I, I thought that was the thing that really spoke to me about this movie was the, was the stuff about class and the stuff about the way that these mm-hmm. kids relate to this private high school. I mean, I think the most fascinating character in the whole thing was the coach. At the private high school. Oh yeah, wow, um, a lot. I it was one, he's one of those characters in a documentary who really doesn't know that he's a character. Like he is not. It's not that he's like a like he's not the villain of the piece at all, but he just doesn't know how he comes across mm-hmm. and is mostly supportive, but also says just a couple of things here and there, and you're like, you really have some backwards stuff going on, but the way that you think about these kids and the way that you think mm-hmm. about what's going on here. Well, I never played any sort of sport, any sort of manner, but I've seen a lot of high school coaches and coaches for younger kids in a peripheral sense, and I think what this movie captured so well is that I think they have a very, very firm understanding of what they need to be doing, mm-hmm. but that only applies to how long the kids are on the team. Right. They are really great uh, coaches and it's very uncomfortable for non-sports players to watch scenes like when he's yelling at them like to practice yeah. to yeah. harder or to get there and win the game but that's what sports is like right. you this isn't a, a sit down and kind of review your paper thing is you have to kind of get them in the right emotional space to get back out yeah. there and I, that was very fascinating in the film I think it does a very brilliant job where it is showing you this. And the film is, I think, very much pro sports, but it's also very smart to recognize there are upsetting elements of that. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I, and I mean, I didn't do sports, but I was um, heavily involved in a, in a high-pressure activity in high school. I was in a, a very good, uh, nationally recognized choir who similarly tried, basically, we were constantly trying to be the best in the nation. And there is, like, there's a discomfort to watching it, but as someone who grew up in that kind of an environment where it was reasonable... To mm-hmm. be yelled at for doing slightly below world class, like I mean, obviously these these kids are doing are playing basketball at, at honestly an extraordinarily high level for their age. Um, there is something empowering about the high expectations that I and those in those moments oh, yeah. I was I sort of like looked back and I was like, yeah, like it's kind of cool because when you're in that situation, you know that your coach or your choir master or whoever 
mm-hmm. believes that you're actually the best and are yeah. capable of that. And well, I, you hear there's a there's a scene where you hear like sports announcers talking, and then they mention the coach by name. They go, "Oh, there he is, the 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 legend of yeah. uh, what right, Saint, of high school." So I think I mean maybe he's not a huge character in this because to him it's just another day at the office because he knows what he does he's good at what he does and that's it like yeah. he doesn't really need to prove himself or do anything more so i i almost feel like he was the most real person that we saw not well, i think everyone was very most. real everyone was very yeah, real it was yeah, a very that's realistic yeah. and like i wouldn't say <laughs> it is a documentary it was just a very down to earth documentary it wasn't Mm-hmm. It wasn't trying to portray anything more than what it was. It was like, here are the facts, here's what's happening. One of the things I really liked about it was um, seeing the difference in dreams and expectations from the parents versus the kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The kids were all about, you know, playing play basketball and, and being in the NBA and everything. And the parents are just like, if, if they can play well, they'll get into a school and they'll graduate college. That's yeah. all we want. Hopefully they'll, they'll graduate and they'll get before out of your here. school. That's all we want. That was, that was very interesting as mm-hmm. well. And to uh, add to that, um, sorry to interrupt. To add to that, the uh, interviews with the coaches when they were at the Nike school and um, stuff like that, the college coaches, they interviewed them and it was the coaches were saying, like, look, if we don't find these star basketball players, our mm-hmm. team won't do well. I will lose my job as a coach and then I'll be screwed. And yeah. Um, so they're, you know, in kind of in the same boat as the kids that they're looking for. That was a part that the film was really cool about de romanticizing mm-hmm. because they showed those clips. I'm sure they had a ton of footage of people fluffing them up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They chose to show that and they chose to show with the scouters. Yeah. That scouters. was, and they chose yeah. to show Spike Lee. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like oh my gosh. Who is just, I kept waiting for like the, the twist, but no, he just goes off on a small rant about how it's just they about see money. You as, it's all about money. They yeah. just see you as numbers, basically. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it's fantastic because Spike Lee is, is many things uh, a brilliant filmmaker, a very radical, edgy guy, but he's also someone who truly cares about people, I think. Mm-hmm. And that was someone who really looked at a whole crowd mm-hmm. of kids going, I care about you beyond you as a basketball player. Mm. And I think the film kind of has a lot of that mentality as well when they're going through so many elements. It's, yeah. it's a yeah, very so. affectionate movie. Yes. And it, talking about the parents, I I was always, when they talked about financial situations, because there's so much difficulty with that, because we mentioned earlier on that Arthur was going to St. Joe's and was there for a bit, but then they couldn't afford it anymore, the private school. So now the film kind of has two sections where it's William at St. Joe's and Arthur at John Marshall. And But still to watch these families who are struggling in many ways still kind of want to put all their chips in and say, mm-hmm. you could be the next Isaiah Thomas, who is their hero, who went from that to one of the biggest basketball players ever. Just to kind of go, this, like, we want this to pay off and want this to to happen and the odds are so difficult and this film shows very brilliantly that it's not like if you're good enough it is luck it is opportunity Mm -hmm. it is so many things and there is no villain of the movie it is just life being life and it's documented so well I agree yep Yeah, I love that the shadow of Isaiah Thomas was just so huge and everyone was just so prevalent yeah um, I think William said that he he didn't want to be the next Isaiah Thomas. He wanted to he wanted someone else to be the next, the next William, William Gates. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, oh, that, that, was, that was cute. And that's such a powerful thing about sports when you have. Also, we talked about the the kid on the line, but also they really get to be celebrities for this small portion of life. They right. have an entire giant stadium full of people caring about them, mm-hmm. knowing all of their stats, rooting for them and cheering for them at every moment, and that ends on your last game. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. And so a lot of people just kind of want to continue that game, if only for, like, mm-hmm. you don't want to be the most relevant you ever are at 16. I I'm remi- I was reminded throughout it as well with, as one of, with, to one of my favorite shows, Friday Night Lights, uh, which has some characters who live in that high school football world where it is still the most important thing in their lives, um, and thinking about the way that that, that can translate. Um, you know, like I said, I work with kids like 
like William and Arthur every day, and uh, so many of them see basketball as the only thing they'll ever be good at, the only thing they're good at, and they have to be good now. They have to be good immediately, because otherwise mm-hmm. they can't get into college, and yep. since they can't pay for college any other way, because they really can't, then it's over. Um, and there's so much pressure in that moment, and you would hear it from the parents, and you could hear it from the kids. You know, if you don't, like, if there is that feeling at some point when you watch them make that free, free throw, like, if you don't make this free throw, like, your life is over. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, like, that is crazy. It's crazy. And it's, I always enjoyed, and they covered a lot of this, of their academic struggles. Both yeah. of them yeah. are not very good students, but they're never, ever depicted as lazy people. They are going to practice oh, yeah. every single moment. Mm-hmm. Really, their biggest hurdle is because they are they're passionate about becoming the fastest they can be and getting their 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 jump shot just right. And the hurdle is to actually their ACT score. Right. That's, yeah. That is the annoying thing. And yeah. they don't want to know the subject. They just need to get that eighteen. Right. Mm-hmm. Because that eighteen means they get a scholarship, which means they can afford to go to this. And right. that was fascinating. And the film is a very subtle thing about really kind of judging the academics for not treating the kids properly because you had a scene, I believe it was at Marshall High School of like the academic counselor just not connecting with this guy at all. Saying, mm-hmm. you need to work on your Spanish as much as you work on your jump shot. And then he also made a ton of baseball metaphors the rest of the scene. Yeah. <laughs> and the kid was very respectful but he just kind of kept staring at him. And when they, for William, when they give, they take him to a nice like center that's clearly designed to help athletes pass the, right. the minimum. Yeah. The clip they choose to show of the woman teaching them is the most worthless thing in the world, which talks about how yeah. if you teach a monkey oh, to write B's right. and C's, they'll do better than a monkey who knows how to write, write A's and D's on multiple choice. Right. You don't see her teach anything, and the film just goes on, just kind of implying that these kids are bred for basketball mm-hmm. only. Right. It's, oh, it's Well, so and that's bad. been such a thing that's come out recently about the, you know, I mean, all sorts of exposés about illiterate you know, basketball and CAA stars or football stars where that even when they get to college, they're being tracked into tracks that don't actually prepare them for anything but basketball. And, you know, again, when, you were, when I was looking at what happened to these kids afterwards, of course, ultimately, only a very, very small fraction of them will ever go to the NBA. Um, mm-hmm. And so you do have to wonder. I mean, I'm really glad that when I read their stories, I honestly expected the stories to be much sadder because realistically very often mm-hmm. people who follow this path uh, end up graduating from college and doing what exactly you know sad things do happen to them other parts of their life i, I, I think yeah. i don't say anything because you should watch the film and then read what happens later right i agree because mm-hmm. yeah but it but it i mean certainly their their well, stories continue to be scarred by the neighborhoods they grew up in the crime that is around them and their family's own poverty. Mm-hmm. And the something that I found very interesting and also that talks about the really kind of academic corruption of these kids is that we, we mentioned that the kids do play in, in colleges. We won't say which ones and how, but because of the very strict and really messed up rules, they have to be amateurs. And so they can't right, have any licensing. So these kids weren't allowed to make any money off this movie. Oh, you're, oh my gosh, oh, of course. Yeah. That makes perfect yeah. sense. Because yep. they were college athletes. So this film... Mm-hmm. That's so, and did it premiere? It would have premiered when they were in college? This premiered in 94, and they would have been in college because obviously the film... Yeah. So, I mean, and these it also guys are, was one of the most... Are these guys the same age? Does it yes. follow them at the yeah. same time? Uh, okay. I think I Arthur, they were. Arthur's a year younger. Yeah, was I, that, think, okay. I think that's right. But they... Yeah. I mean, these guys... And these guys... I mean, this movie obviously was a huge... Was and is a huge deal. I mean, these guys, it just, just, by, just by being in their, in this movie, they are considered, their notoriety is considered high enough to have Wikipedia pages, which, mm-hmm. uh, you know, is actually pretty big. Um, yeah. But to think, I mean, you're right, it didn't occur to me, but you're right, that when this movie premiered, and they must have become national names, Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. they couldn't get a penny, even, is, is, I mean, of course not, but it's crazy. It's messed up. Uh, another kind of meta thing I wondered when I was watching this is how their high school experience changed. Having a documentary crew follow them the whole four years, yeah. it, if it would have been any different. I thought about that, too, particularly as it related to Arthur, who's at John Marshall High School. I mean, yeah. Arthur, Arthur has a, a 
profile to him, and he mentions even that some of his friends go into drugs, go into other things. He um, that uh, he got he has profile that I recognize very clearly um, from kids I work with on the west side, and uh, I do have to think that I mean the power of positive reinforcement with kids is so high, and you do see at the very end of the movie the documentary crew actually does interact with Arthur. Mm-hmm. Um, they are caught on this, camera once. Yeah, there's, well, no, it's not, it's not even they're on camera. There's this really cool scene where he's written a paper. Is that William? About, no, oh, maybe it was, it was Arthur. It was, Arthur. I think it was Arthur. He wrote and he's a written a paper about butterflies. About yes. butterflies. And, yeah. one of, and one of the, it's one of the documentary film crew, who has obviously known him for like four years, yeah. saying, you know, hey, I, like, no, I want you to read it to me. I, I want to hear what it sounds like when you write. And it just occurred to me, looking at that, that he probably had positive adults and even maybe even mentors who even if they weren't following him around every day coming into his life regularly um and what a difference that must have made to him and they've long since the films ended have still befriended them their family for a very long time sure. and you know we talked in episode two about the documentary series human planet and we talked a little bit about the ethics of can they should the you know they don't actually want not right and this is one of the things where the documentarians did change things a little bit because this isn't mentioned in the film I read about later. They turned Arthur's family's lights back on. There's a point sure. where oh, they... Wow. That they, doesn't surprise they, me. The, the filmmakers and with help of the grant, they paid for the debt and turned the lights back on. Uh, okay. oh. Yeah, and I mean, that's the kind of thing, I mean, I will say as a, as a privileged person who, you know, encounters that kind of poverty regularly, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, those documentarians must have felt very connected to these families and wanted to help. Mm-hmm. And they've done other things. In fact, Steve James, who has primarily... He's primarily made more documentaries, but I think he made one fictional TV film that I haven't seen. But apparently Arthur actually acts in that film very briefly. Huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. And he's done a couple other things like that. William is something really, really cool after this film. Where he actually, I'll say this, this is fine. He stopped playing basketball for quite a while, but he actually, when Michael Jordan came back from retirement, oh, yeah. William was part of the the people who helped train him to kind of be back to NBA standards. Yeah. Where he oh, would wow. play with Michael Jordan every day. And That's really cool. It was funny, there was a, I think it was one of the Criterion essays where they, like, William was very, like, subconscious because he was there, like, the core group. And then once he was getting. Once Jordan was getting better, he invited more NBA players to help, kind of help practice them. And William thought, oh, I'm not needed anymore. And then Jordan said, no, I need you along with them. Uh, kind actually, of brought him. Oh, so man, he that's, that's the dream, isn't it? That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, because Jordan is... I mean, Although, I mean, it's not like when Jordan came back out of retirement, he did anything. As, as a person from Washington, let me be clear, <laughs> Michael Jordan did us no good. I'm sorry. Washington it's, Wizards buzzer. I'm sorry, but, it's still Michael Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. You're still the star of Space Jam. Important. Thank you, Lee. I think we brought this full circle. I think that's where we need to. (laughs) So, I I was was interested. I was going to say one more thing because I just, it's a three hour film, and when this film ended, it's my second time watching it. I did watch it in two segments, but I could watch another hour. I could watch watch a sequel of three more hours of what happened then ten years later. Yeah, I want to, yeah, I want that to see more, too. That was one thing I was really kind of grateful for, because we do have this 20 years later, we do have the ability to see what happened to them afterwards, yeah. whereas, like, if it came out yesterday, mm-hmm. we wouldn't. So I kind of appreciated that, you know, I it's, waited so long to yeah, see this movie. It's funny, I, I actually looked it up halfway through. Yeah, me too. I was <laughs> because I, no, because I really, no, because I really, like, I was, honestly, I was invested enough in them that it was really, like, horrible for me, because because I know so many of these stories end poorly, I really wanted to know if they made it. Yeah. Um, but I will say, uh, before I give my hand rating, because I imagine it'll be a little lower, I could not watch another three hours of this movie. I, it, there, although I think it's a beautiful, meandering piece, there are, and the end is awesome, and the beginning is awesome, there are definitely times in the middle that it, there's just... There's whole scenes that could have been a nice deleted scenes bunch. I just, I, I yeah. I, I, I respectfully disagree because I think it's such a, part of the reason why it moves so fast for me is that it is so brilliantly edited and that they really, every scene is super, super short. And it's only like a minute or two, so it kind of goes by really quickly. They don't 
dive into long on something. They don't really kind of... It really is like, here is the core element. Like, those scenes we mentioned about Spike Lee, that's maybe 90 seconds of footage. Yeah, it's very short. Yeah. It's actually, it's, they really did take five years and put it into a very tight three hours. Mm-hmm. It's And the fun Oscar thing, because it actually had a ton of Oscar controversy in that uh, there's a whole... They discovered a whole corruption within the Oscars because it wasn't about their best documentary. And then uh, people were hoping it got best picture. It wasn't nominated? No, not at all. That's Uh, bizarre. It's a crazy corruption. Oh, the flashlight thing? Yeah, that, yeah, it it gets insane. (laughs) Man, I want a whole second podcast on that. And with all the corruption, the Academy actually was able to compliment the film in a unique way in that it did get one Oscar nomination, which I still believe is the only time the documentary has ever gotten this category, which is best film editing. Oh. I can see that. See that? So it didn't win, um, but it was <laughs> nominated in that category as the one nomination. Proof terms. Alright, I can see that. It had good editing. But you thought it was slow. I mean, it, but no, no, that's true. Well, it's, but that's from her experience. She can appreciate the well doneness of the editing. Yeah, I mean, it was well done. I just, it was. Um, slow editing is not necessarily bad editing. Right. Yeah. It wasn't even that slow. I didn't I, think so. I didn't think it was slow. Uh, I. I mean, to me, to me, the movie dragged a little bit, but not like I understood why it was that long, and I didn't think it could have been effectively made any shorter. But I think it was, yeah, well done. Voice just a lot, of, just a lot of movie to watch. You got to be ready for what you're going to sit down for. I think in the the Ebert and Siskel, Siskel and Ebert clips they had on the Criteria DVD, when comedy about how long it is, I think Ebert just turns the camera and goes. It, it, if you're going to go see Richie Rich, it's just one more hour. It's perfect. <laughs> I was like, oh, 1994 references. That's yeah, cool. Richie Rich. Another movie that should be on the list. <laughs> no, it's Never seen it. I think we should, yeah. every, every other movie that we mention, we should rate it. <laughs> <laughs> and like, just keep a list of all of the movies that we, that we ironically reference as that should be on the yeah. list, and then like, Run a marathon. Well, that'll be our sequel podcast. Because Space yeah. Jam and Richie Rich are definitely the first two entries, and I'm totally in. Richie Rich bummed me out because I saw that before North and Northwest. So, so I was thinking, oh, what a clever idea that they're on their faces of Mount Rushmore to action scene. That's uh, North Northwest. I was like, oh, Richie Rich has no original ideas in this report. Oh, uh, that is kind of sad. Mm-hmm. Anywho, hinge readings for hoop dreams. Let's mm-hmm. go around the board. Uh, Lee, you go first. Uh, I'll give it a solid four. It's a three hour long movie and I didn't fall asleep. Yeah. Low standards there. <laughs> I'll, hey, I'll, hey. I'll echo that and I'll say four because I think it's a good movie. Everyone, it deserves a shot. You should watch it. Um, Ditto. Well done. Good job, Hoop Dreams. <laughs> I'll up the average and say four and a half. Mm. I liked it a lot. I'm going to go with actually a 4.8. I think this is truly an incredible piece of art. And I'm going to be a Debbie Downer and go at 3.5 as the representative of someone who's not a sports documentary person. You kind of have to like watching long basketball shots if you're going to like this movie, and I don't. I thought the mm-hmm. lowest rating was from the girl on the West Side of Chicago. No, well, don't get me wrong. It does a wonderful job of portraying some of that stuff. I just, uh, I just, I don't know. Anyway. Yep, that's in the record now. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> it's canon. That's this game. film is currently on Netflix and is on Criterion Blu-ray. I recommend people check it out if they haven't seen it yet. So now let's move on to the album. The album is called This Is Hardcore, and Lee, I have to ask you, would you qualify it as hardcore? Uh, maybe? If we're talking about hardcore Britpop, then totally, yeah, it's hardcore. All right. Hardcore Britpop. How is the album? Um. Okay, so... I think it's pretty funny that, like, last week's album was a Britpop album, and then this week is another Britpop album. Um, This one is definitely better than last week's, I have to say. So, um, also, I I have a case of mono, so my attention span's really, really low right now, so... Perfect. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, it it definitely was a struggle to listen to this album all the way through a couple times. But not because it's a bad album, just because I cannot pay attention to anything right now. That is the weird part of how we exist, is that we are immortal, we don't die, but we do keep getting sick. There's just no suspense that we we're going to die it's, from it. I've had, mono, kind of awful. I've had mono 30 times. That's uh, yeah. not bad. And it's, <laughs> mono is, but, and it's just as horrible every time, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, it is. Yep. It's it like is. the first time all over again. Yeah, it's, I, it's I, awful. Which I've only ever had it the once. I don't don't know kiss that. frat boys, guys. This is what <laughs> I learned from my most recent bout of mono. <laughs> I will keep that in mind. Good. I only get it from frat boys. That's I know, right? <laughs> it's always frat boys. Yeah. Always the frats. 
<laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Wait, wait, this on. album, yeah. I, overall, I thought it was pretty good. Um, it was a good listen to. Some of the times I got a little repetitive, I think. Um, so, yeah. I don't know, Austin, what do you think? I really, really liked this one. It was a very... I guess it, I didn't really think about it being a Britpop as well. But, cause it was well, such... it, it's on the kind of back end of the Britpoppy, because last week um, it was Blur, Modern Life is Rubbish, and that was in 93. This album came out in 98, so there's five years difference, and this album is um, Pulp's sixth album, so they've had a, they had a bit of time to like develop their sound, whereas um, Blur did not. It was just their second album, and they kind of ran with sound that they already kind of knew. I thought this was very confident. This makes sense that it's, it's later in their run. I found so many of the songs to be really incredible at times because it is within the pop genre, and they're very catchy, yet very, very sad about very oh, yeah, difficult so topics. Oh, yeah, so sad. Like, there's one of the best songs, I believe it's called A Little Soul. That one's good, yeah. Where it's all about a dad talking to his son about like, trying like, not to make the mistakes he did, and he clearly like, beats his mom, the, the, the boy's mom. Yeah. And it's and yet it still has like, a kind of catchy tune. Like, it's trying to really kind of infuse these ideas in there. And there are just so many songs about these difficult emotions that I'm going to guess the, the songwriters are having or just what they're observing. My favorite song on the album was called Dishes which is about a guy who just keeps comparing himself to Jesus Christ because he has the same initials. But he says, I can't turn water into wine. That's impossible. But I can make this this plate dry. Yeah. It's all about him doing the dishes. And it's it's all about someone, like, overwhelmed by their limitations. And obviously not talking about miracles of what he wants to accomplish, but I think trying to do more emotional things with those he's close to. It's it's all these kind of things like that, and it's very very witty lyrics. I kept like really focusing on what they were saying because there's some very clever things going on, especially in the song TV movie. And yeah, it's really good. I really like this one a lot. I definitely enjoyed listening to this one more. Again, I can't pay attention to hardly anything right now. So when you're talking about lyrics, I'm I'm just kind of nodding on my head along. <laughs> Perfect although, podcast material. Hmm, although yes, help. Yes. Help well, so the aged. The old gods like it. Help the aged was amusing to me because it just—it's this really, really depressing song about helping older people because they used to be like you. They used to be young, and now you should help them because they're old. And that was really depressing. Yeah, it, it's it's so many kind of. It's almost all about confused emotions. In many yeah, ways. And I like that. And the one that I thought was almost the the most fun musically was the title track of This Is Hardcore, which actually felt like a Bond song at times. It did. And the music video for it is really interesting as well. That's one thing I like about being able to um, view and listen to these albums that are a little bit older, unlike some of the like younger albums on the list, because they do have music videos that are tied along with them. And the music before video for This Is Hardcore is very, very interesting, and I highly recommend watching it. What was that? I listened to the album again before recording this, and I really like a lot of the lyrics, and I love the, the Bond-esque, like, awesome background music. Yeah. I was trying to figure out what exactly the song was about, and I th- right. think my theory is wrong, but what is the music video like? The music video is, like, a bunch of... It starts off with people, like, auditioning for um, a movie, it looks like. And then there's just these different actors who are portraying these scenes. And then, like, you can definitely tell. You don't hear when ac- when it's cut, when action's called cut. But you definitely see it from how they change their mannerisms and everything. And it's just, it's just a very interesting... And that's part of the lyrics, too. It's all about, let's make a movie, and we can make it really hardcore. And I was worried it was about, like, a sad attempt to, like, make a sex tape to spice up a romance. Hmm. So that's what I thought it was about, but I wasn't quite sure. So that wasn't what the music video was about. No, it was not. The I definitely recommend the music video because it's really well done. I, this was a really I like every album I listen to. I never heard of this band before. Never heard any of these songs before. And this is once again it's gonna stay on my phone because I really like it. <laughs> Ooh, so I'm gonna tie this to Harry Potter because what? I'm gonna do that every way, anytime I can. 
So Javis Cocker, which Jarvis Cocker, which is a fantastic name, by the way. <laughs> he's the lead singer of um, Pulp. He was also the lead singer of the fictional band Weir- The Weird Sisters. What? Harry Potter, Goblet of Fire. And he wrote all the songs for it. Boom. Boom. No, I was it. listening to this album, and I was like, this sounds kind of familiar. Why do I know this? Was this in Harry Potter? Sure enough. It was <laughs> That's impressive. And Hoop Dreams could also be a documentary about Quidditch. But it's not. Oh, no. That'd be so much better, in my basketball. opinion. Yeah. It five out five inches. <laughs> you just gave a higher rating to a not-real documentary. Yep, because it would be fascinating to see two kids from inner city Chicago trying to win a Quidditch <laughs> championship. Come, Come on, on, how would that not be great? It'd be no, amazing. Okay. <laughs> I listened to the album. Yay! I did. Um, and uh, I I, th- I think I've said this before, that I listen to music very casually and just listen to the like the musicianship and not so much think about what the lyrics are saying. But this is still a really fun album to listen to, um, even if you're not like actually listening to it yes. like yeah. I do. And um, the title, I like a lot. Just saying like... This is hardcore. It kind of uh, explains what their whole album is going to be about. It's saying like this is what we think is hardcore. Um, so I don't know. I like. It's to be I like sincere. It. Like, yeah, this is hardcore. Yeah, this difficulties. Right, right, and and like you said, the songs were poppy and fun. Um, I, well, maybe not poppy, but they were. They were catchy. Catchy. Thank you. They were catchy and fun, um, but like some really hardcore topics in the lyrics. So, yeah, I like that. Could, would you say it's a concept album, or is that... Crazy? I think so. It does seem to focus on emotional cores that are difficult. There's no, like... I think the... I was going to listen to the lyrics again, make sure I'm not just completely wrong, but Sylvia, I think, is the catchiest song. I'm sure yeah. I'm just undercurrent yeah. going on there. Yeah, I loved Sylvia. I kind of... Um, between the song This Is Hardcore and... Um, Sylvia, I kind of lost it a little bit. I know you said you liked The Little Soul, but... A Little Soul is, is one of my favorites on it, for sure. It was really good. The one Sylvia thing, really brought it back for me. The one weird thing about this album, and this is our first, and definitely won't be the last, album where the album cover is a naked lady, and... It happens a lot in rock and roll. It does, and I it threw me off because I listened to this primarily when I was walking to and from work, to and from lunch, and so whenever the song changed, I would take out my phone to see what the new song was called, or if this was this, and it's just a picture of a naked lady on my phone. <laughs> With, like, no, like, very little wording. Just need to make sure she's still there. Yeah. It's, like, <laughs> it's always using me at a, a stoplight, just kind of people, <laughs> or on the train. So, like, more, like, I just, like, almost, like, wait, like, okay. Sitting right next to someone. So that was actually the most hardcore thing about it. Because right? <laughs> I just kept accidentally <laughs> having a naked lady Looking on Looking at phone. naked ladies? Yeah. Just yes. one naked lady. Accidentally. Nice. So that was amusing for me. But, Ooh. Leah, are you wanting to do hedges now? Yeah, sure. How would you rate this? Um, I'll go three and a half hedges. Um... It was good, don't get me wrong. It was better than um, other Britpop we've listened to on the podcast, but there were still some parts where I felt they were repetitive, and it was just kind of, like um, like Adam said, between This Is Hardcore and Sylvia, it just kind of loses it, because um, it, it just sounds the same, really. So, three and a half. Um, can I do 4.05? Yeah. <laughs> We mm-hmm. on our website, which is being built right now, we do go to two spaces. Nice. Okay, I'm going to do four point zero five. This is going to get in line. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with four point two. I really like this. This is the first album in the podcast I listened to twice before the recording, and I just found myself completely caught up in it again. Um, this is such a great song to me. I love that song a lot. Yeah, I'm definitely going to listen to this album again. So Adam, I have to ask, yes. what is the zero, the point zero five for? I just, I don't feel good about giving it a f- just a flat four. It's better than a four, but not much better than a four. Okay, mm. you know that is very literal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's hopefully the next thing is better than a four. I guess it's always uh, hopeful. Uh, we uh, have the food, which I can't pronounce, and I'm not honestly sure if I can pronounce it, but I believe it's pronounced pasia sleva. 
based on my uh, brief uh, looking through of how you pronounce okay. stuff in Finnish. So what this is, is is a Finnish, that's Finnish like the country, like Finland, not Finnish like a Finnish line, Finnish Easter mm-hmm. bread. Um, so it's always, it's traditionally made uh, after Easter, and it's traditionally made, uh, the reason it's for Easter is because you make it with all of the ingredients that you can't have during Lent, uh, including eggs and milk uh, and sugar and various People other... give up milk for Lent? Well, it's more like heavy foods. Like, you're not supposed to eat, like, cream and, uh, and milk and, and okay. things like that. So, um, it is, uh, uh, that is its, its its sort of purpose. It's like a sweet bread that's eaten at breakfasts and things like that. So, uh, this review is a bit of an asterisk, partially because uh, it is not currently Easter, which means that I could not buy this bread anywhere, but I made it. Um, so, if you Google the recipe for, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and post a recipe on our Facebook page, on the one that I use. Whatever we... Whatever, <laughs> I don't know. How do you not listen to the end of the show? I don't. Twitter! Just, we have a Twitter! We have we'll, Twitter. I can put it on the Twitter. We'll put it on the, the I can The Twitter. I've seen on the website. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, um, I will put the recipe I used. Uh, I did bake it. The result of my baking did not <laughs> look like what I think it's supposed to look like because my bread did not rise properly. So, just... Baking nerd thing. This is a yeast bread, okay? So it's it's leavening agent is yeast. Uh, the yeast is need, is supposed to activate in a mixture of the hot water and milk. Um, and I don't believe my yeast activated correctly, or it's possible my kitchen was not warm enough. Basically, you need to give this bread a lot of time to rise, and mine just didn't rise quite the way that it needed to. On the other hand, so basically. What I came out with is more like a scone, whereas the bread is more like a bread. Like, you could actually cut it in pieces and put butter on it. Um, but what I think I did nail, and therefore the boys can appreciate, uh, and I will resample again, is the flavor profile of the bread, which is the major flavors are, in the dough you've got orange rind, lemon rind, and um, cardamom, and then dates and almonds in the batter along with a lot of sugar uh and i will let the boys eat some of it it's a little i I also made it two days ago so it's a little stale um (laughs) but it is really good uh i think but of course i mean i totally meant to finish that sentence without making a judgment so that the boys could eat it first but uh please ignore texture i I think you know making it is completely out of a lot of things worthy of an asterisk it's not like you reviewed it Show without subtitles, right? That oh, for sure. But I just, I just want everyone to know that I think that uh, I think you got to watch your yeast uh, when you when you, you you're going to need to make sure your yeast activates because mine did not. Um, not enough love. Not, you know what, Pedro? I loved it plenty, you jerk. Um, I loved it <laughs> enough. Not. You sound so angry. I am angry. Do you know how frustrating it is <laughs> to wait for bread to double in size and have it never do so? It's very frustrating. I think you have to, as you're watching it in the oven, you have to say, yeast, activate. The worst thing is it's not in the oven. I, obviously, you've never made yeast bread, but you just stick it on your counter mm. and wait. I'm sorry, but like... Oh, excuse me. I have made yeast bread. Excuse but you me. You just sit it on your counter and just wait for magic to happen. And if it doesn't, there's like very little you can do about it. You just sort of stare at it and hope that it works. Anyway. Pretty much, yeah. Now we've all tried it. Um, this is actually delightful. This is a really I know, nice, right? It's a nice little bread. Like, I so I this flavor combination is a flavor combination I now want to put in everything I make. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. The cardamom is sort of the 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 I don't know exactly what that is flavor. Where what like, the hell oh. is cardamom? So it, it's a spice. Um, it's a it create it's it ta- it has the same sort of like the spiciness of cinnamon, but it doesn't taste anything like cinnamon. I would say yeah, it's okay. kind of. Uh, I'm getting like citrus and cinnamon. Citrus. Yeah, but like there's a lot of well, there's uh, there's citrus in the bread. So that's right. not the cardamom. Right, right. right. Um, yeah, and I don't know. I've never had cardamom by itself, so I can't really say. But this tastes very much like um, the holidays. Yes. Which we're recording mm-hmm. this near the holidays. Yes. Yeah. So. And, and cardamom is a pretty common. It's a pretty common ingredient in various kinds of celebration breads from Sweden and German, Sweden and Germany and other Northern European okay. countries. So you've probably had it in stolen or other. Mm-hmm. Um, and the bread is, is nice coloring to it. So, yeah, so it's, it's, is that what this yeah. is? The these these spots of flavor. Uh, well, mean, there's so in the bread. Spots of, spots of flavor. Spots of flavor. <laughs> I don't know also, how to do this segment. Um, so the bread has dates and almonds in the in the in the bread as well. Sounds good. 
It's real good, honestly. Like, I'm gonna post a recipe. I, if you are a bread person, this is a really good thing to make. Yeah. I how, do you, love how, do you, it. how do you get dates in Sweden? Finland. Well, Finland. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it you, doesn't matter. Just do. Idiot. It's still pretty far away. From. It's a good point, actually. I mean, they are they are like a Mediterranean thing, but all the recipes I looked for, I looked at, called for dates, hmm. dates and almonds, which like, all right. I mean, you know, I don't know trade and stuff, but That's yeah, I like. I want to make Christmas cookies with Tassie Sleipa, mm-hmm. uh, oh, uh, flavoring profiles. Like, I just feel like this set of flavors I want to put in everything I ever make. It's so tasty. Yeah. I want some, like, cream cheese or some, like, light frosting on this. Yeah, and that's, so one of the things it suggested was I could have made, like, a confectioner's sugar glaze to go as icing, basically. Oh, yeah. I thought that would make it a little bit too sweet because it is a pretty sweet bread, mm-hmm. um, but it is really tasty. Um, yeah. I'm really glad that I got to try this because I would never have known about it if it wasn't for this podcast. Yeah, I like this a lot. It's very tasty to me. Yeah. yeah. You should put up the recipe. For we, sure. We for I'm sure. kind of curious now. We yeah. I, put it I, and, but, I, but I will I will just say, like, it is it is a bread for bread makers. Like, I did it wrong. So oh, yeah. you're probably just, better than me. We definitely this. will put it on Twitter shortly after this podcast airs. And it'll be up on our website as well once the website is finished. And also, we'd love to hear about if you guys make this bread. We do so have an email address at theimmortalspodcast at gmail.com. Specifically, uh, uh, you Swedes out there, tell us how you get your dates. Fins. Fins. Oh my gosh. Fins. 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 Come Fins. on. Sorry. I, racist. I, that's right. Finish, because not finished. But also, if you are Swedish, then yeah, do, do send us here. Yeah. No, no, you can too. too. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're allowed to. We're doing a Swedish show next. It's not a good show. <laughs> We're still looking out for you. Um, I do have one thing. Don't put this on peanut butter and jelly. This is not. Oh a peanut no, butter it's and jelly it's, it's a it's like a co- it's more like a coffee cake. Oh, absolutely. Than like oh a yes, bread. yes. That's really that's Perfect. what it is. I like this better than coffee cakes. I'm not oh, for coffee. sure. I don't really like yeah. coffee cake, but this is this is a great substitution for coffee cake. I mm-hmm. hope to make this many times in the future. I'm super stoked. Yeah. Dip this okay. In some the coffee. pictures I have a question because I can't see what it looks like. It kind of looks like hala. So that's that's what my bread doesn't look like. Okay. Um. It, yes. It it's supposed to rise so that there's a, it's nice and um, you know has lots of air pockets, uh, but then with dates and stuff in it, uh, but with the flavorings that are the same. Uh, so yeah, it does. It's that's what it's supposed to look like, and not what mine looks like. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> does it taste similar to challah? No, not at all. Okay. So challah. I mean, challah is it, delicious it, and yummy. It's delicious and yummy, but I mean, this has a strong labor profile like it has okay. stuff in it it's not just bread it's like it's more it's closer to pastry than bread in that it has that strong like you would taste this flavor profile you wouldn't be able like you said you wouldn't put peanut butter and jelly on this you wouldn't put you know no, you would it eat, is it, bread by itself, it itself. Yeah. yeah maybe some icing but not like too flavorful icing yeah. just like nice yeah cream cheese i think is the Ooh, yeah the no, cream cheese rock. i think yeah oh you know what you could do oh you could do cream cheese frosting on this. That sounds amazing. And that would be like I can't tell if Adam shaking his head. Adam like, Adam, Adam looks like bad. Adam Adam looks very serious you about just, this wonderful you, choice. You broke me with the flavor. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so shall we hedge this? Hedge yeah. it up. It's your bread. Do it first. Oh man, so it's hard because I'm self critical, but I'm gonna give this five hedges. point <laughs> seven hedges. Oh wow. I nice. love I love this bread. I think it's I think it's delicious. I also really want to do it right next time. <laughs> you um, said, I'm going to be a little critical on myself. Yeah, my joke was perfect. fine. Like, <laughs> Honestly, no. This is better than Hoop Dreams. <laughs> it is better than Hoop Dreams. Um, no, I, I, uh, I, this flavor profile, I think the reason that I rate it so highly, despite my failures, is that this flavor profile is a wonderful new discovery. Yeah, it's great. That's true. Adam? 4.5. Not quite as good as Space Jam. Mm. <laughs> 4.3. 4. I think it's really good. I, I recommend it, and I think it's very tasty. Aw, thanks, huh? guys. I always feel I always feel very gratified when there's some sort of like my own cooking that has to go into the food. Well, you poisoned us last week, so we had a little. <laughs> oh my god, that stuff was so gross. No, you didn't. It's still in my apartment. Oh god, he oh, Adam has to eat it. Oh. Anyhow, now let's move on to a TV show that actually just finished airing its second season when we're recording this podcast. It is a show called Arne Dahl. It is a Swedish detective show that, like a lot of European detective shows, it is becoming popular by, with English subtitles this time, unlike last week, where a lot of, it's just been a big trend lately to have 
European crime shows pop up everywhere. Things like The Bridge and the original version of The Killing. This is in the same kind of format of popularity where people have been really enjoying the, the long tales of this one Swedish police unit, Unit A, as they solve crimes. And there are 10 stories within 20 episodes. Everything is a two-parter. And with season one, that means they are 90-minute episodes apiece, which means you have a three-hour adaptation. And these are all based off novels from the author named Arne Dahl. And it's a very interesting show. It's This wasn't my favorite. I do enjoy detective shows quite a bit. And I watched all of season one, all ten of those episodes, and then season two, which just aired in 2015. Season one, I believe, was 2012. It took a while between oh, wow. seasons. And I watched four of the ten episodes of season two, which means I saw two full stories, A Midsummer's Night Dream and Requiem. And I... I liked it, never loved it. It was very curious to see the difference between the two seasons because they are procedurals first, but they really do want to look a little bit into the lives of these people, especially when you have a three-hour runtime for one story. So you actually get to see some of their interpersonal relations. You get to see some of their romantic ups and downs, fine scenes. But it was never the mysteries were never that much to completely compel me. And I, I think it's a bit of the dryness of the filming, not exactly the cases themselves. Because you get some really interesting things. You have a favorite episode of the whole bunch is the two-parter called Bad Blood from season one, which involves an American serial killer who's now tormenting in, in Europe. It these big things, and it's just always... I think it was tricky with the three-hour runtime at times. Because with the first two stories, The Blinded Man and Bad Blood, it's very intense, things are going to be happening now. But The Blinded Man... They knew someone was going to die like within a limited amount of time, so they had, they had more of a need to solve the case immediately. But as the show went on, it kind of it knew it couldn't have that same sort of format each time. So it was very relaxed, and it, it wanted to show every step, but it wasn't as always that exciting. Like, for example, the movie that's currently out now called Spotlight, which really is all about the process of doing uh, reporting a story, this didn't have that kind of energy as that did. Season two did have, it almost felt like a different show. It, it was now one hour episode, a two hour story, and it felt more like a TV show you see nowadays. The production values were up, the lighting was up, and the characters got a bit more stereotypical. Season two actually has a new person on the unit, and they actually did the cliche thing of like, tell me what they all are. And they go, this guy, he's the best cop in the world. Always trust him. This guy, he does analytical stuff. This guy, he's the best hacker in the world. And I'm watching this. I've now seen them for 15 hours. I'm like, that guy's a hacker? Wait, what? <laughs> it, it kind of it pigeonholed them into very specific things instead of the, the vagueness of a real character. It was very strange to watch them try to almost be more popular in season two. It was more... It was more exciting. It was all the things I complained about season one, and it got fixed in season two, but still didn't fix it entirely for me. Which is actually reminding me of, I'm currently reading, in addition to all things for this podcast, the latest Elizabeth Salander book, which, that's the girl's drawing tattoo. And that was a Swedish trilogy of books. And then the author was murdered, and now someone new is writing the series because it's such a huge hit. And the original trilogy I liked quite a bit, but had the same thing of, oh, this is really, really boring for 20 pages. This new book is never boring for that long, ever. But still feels the same, but you kind of miss the boringness of the original. So that's my completely conflicted review of this show. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of the, you miss the reality of it? It seems like uh, yes. season one was more realistic, season two was more entertaining. Yes, and I think the best show is, uh, is in right in the middle, and... When it was more realistic in season one, it still had some things I had an issue with. Like, there was a clue in season in the first story, Blind a Man, which I thought was way too convenient and actually kind of stupid that this clue was, oh, this is one, there's only five of these jazz CDs on the entire planet. We can track down who has this. Wow. And jazz nerds never copy CDs, so we know we're fine. <laughs> and I was like, that is insane that first off, someone that 
Force knows about this, and that everyone in the world just abides by this rule of like, oh, we're never going to copy this CD ever. It, it was just a very convenient thing. But also, I think it was the guy's first novel. There was never a bad clue like that throughout the rest of the series. Mm. So, I do like this, and this is a kind of show that I can definitely see recommending to a lot of mystery fans that I know, because it really is respecting the mystery instead of having certain things. But especially after seeing seven of the stories in a row, the, the tropes appeared. I think every story has a hospital scene with, with one of them or one of the suspects getting injured, and they're all hanging around the bedside. Um, Handcuffed think, to the side of the. No, you know. it was never. It was never a bad guy. Also, it was always a good guy. Of like, uh, ah. we're worried about you. There, I think, it was almost always a sex scene filmed the exact same way. It was just almost like, oh, we have these things that the story always does. And also, season two recast some people, and that threw me off for like too long. I know it's been three years, and I can't always get the same actors back. But it was silly. Do you know what the reason was for the gap? You know, I think it's a bit... A lot of European countries just don't have the TV market that the UK and America does. For example, there's a really wonderful French show called The Returned that was very creepy. Mm. It just had a two, three Great break show. between it. And that one, the creator said, we would have loved to make this the next year, but France just doesn't have a TV budget to kind of be like, oh, it made a turnaround. So I think it's a little bit of that, and I think also that... Each one of these is adapted from one of Arnie Dahl's novels, and they've now done all ten. So I don't think there were five more novels out when season uh, one finished. Okay. So I bet season three might be even longer, unless they decide to make up their own stories, which they could. I mean, they have the characters, they have some good actors involved, and it's popular enough to be on this list. So it apparently plays very well in the UK, because there's a, apparently BBC4 is just all devoted to other European crime stories. Mm-hmm. So, Arne Dahl, the season one is on DVD in the US and just finished playing on the BBC in the UK. I will give it uh, 3.5 hinges and it's one of those I wouldn't recommend to everybody but if you're really into mysteries, especially procedurals, this is your up your alley. So now let's move on to back to Europe with a very strange children's book. Uh, let's not preface with too much, Austin. Sorry, I thought it is it was from not that strange. One continent. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say which one. Uh, it's Hungary. It's a Hungarian uh, book, and uh, it's called um, "Just Who Does This Child Take After," or uh, "Who Does This Kid Take After?" The actual. Hungarian is, uh, I'm going to try to pronounce it. Nail it. For it. This is going to be interesting. Here we go. Kire Utot is a Gierek. That's not that Perfect. Mm-hmm. Sounds, sounds great. Yeah, sounds yeah, perfect. it sounds really cool. Um, it's by Eva Janikowski. That's with a J. Uh, and it's illustrated <laughs> by Laszlo Raber. Um, and um, so overall... I enjoyed this book. It's it's very short. It's definitely uh, it was written in 1974, and it's it's in the 12 plus uh, category. Um, so you have to be 12 years old in order to read it. That was a bit surprising because it is a picture book format. Yeah, so it's it's a picture book format, and it's it's about a kid. It starts out with this kid who's um, I would say like five or six, and his parents love him unconditionally. Um, his aunts and uncles and grandparents love him. And then he grows up a little bit, and uh, he's, you know, growing up like we all do and not really doing what his parents necessarily want. And so the the conceit is, like, at the beginning, everyone says, oh, he takes after your dad, takes after your mom. And then later he's like, oh, he doesn't take after me. That's, that's not me. It takes after you. Um, so I can understand the 12 plus because I would probably, I would, I would give this to, if I ever had a kid, which I mean, hell no, but if I ever had a kid, um, I would, I would give this to them like when they were like eight or nine maybe and just have them read it and then have them read it maybe five, 10 years later and then five, 10 years after that. Cause I think that you can see this book in a lot of different ways. It has a very interesting kind of uh, uh, 
dialogue. I think that's what surprised me. I guess why I unfairly called it a little strange is that when I started off reading it, it had like that simple like children's books thing of like, oh, I love you so much. You look like your mom and your dad. Mm-hmm. And and, uh, sorry to jump in. Yeah. I think the beginning of it was when he was younger, and yes. so it had that style. Exactly. And then they later on. Gone. Yeah. And I found that to be very interesting because I've always kind of criticized children's films and children's books because they all have the same message, which is either be yourself or save the environment because no one's going to disagree with those things. Right. <laughs> it's the simplest stories to tell. And this one is about being yourself, but this one's way more focused on the difficulty of that. I found that to be very interesting because everyone they're talking to are people who still care for him, but they're just disappointed because their imagery and narrative of what his life is going to be is not perfect. He's Whenever he's like just growing up and messing up, he's seen that as giant criticism, not learning development, mm-hmm. where ultimately trying to be his own person. Right. And at, at one point, um, his dad, like, he invites his friends over, and his dad says, oh, they, they didn't know how to properly shake hands. And, I mean, that's just, it's just kind of a, ends up being a generational gap. Right. Like, they they respect the dad and whatever, but, you know, it's, you don't have to It's, it's differences. Hands. They're never really seen as antagonists. It's just differences between the two of them and the frustrations about it. Yeah. It's very, we read this in a, curious format this is as we said it's a hungry book and it there is an english translation on kindle currently but they kind of whited out all the the picture pages and then translate the text separately so we read it as empty pages um with words after it yes. it and that was not the best way to read it i kind of wish this was translated Better than like, actually like, proper translation. Yeah, so learn Hungarian sure, before yeah. you read this book. Yeah. And then and then read it. Ha- have a good time with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the translation wasn't bad. It did definitely feel awkward at times. Like, that wasn't like... It was a confusing sentence every once in a while. Right. You had to kind of look for the intention of it all. So it's not one that you can kind of easily mm-hmm. recommend. Like, you can't easily hand this to a kid as well as you could something else because there just isn't a available translation as well, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, I think there might have been more back in the time. Is possibly. You may yeah. have gone out of print. In yeah, there are a lot of out of print versions yeah. of this that were very, very, very expensive, and the, the Kindle one was just like five, six bucks. Right. So, yeah. So pick it up on Kindle like if you have a Kindle. Um, I like the illustrations. They're they're always very, they're fun. They are fun. It has. It's not entirely. It's almost like a mixture between the really like focused cartoon and a stick figure. Like, it, it's very, mm-hmm. the arms moving in not exactly traditional ways and very colorful. Yeah. <laughs> I like the illustrations. Yeah. Yeah, there's Are more. they all, like, the one that you sent in the group text? Yes. Okay. That is yeah. a very interesting style. Yeah, it is. It's it's mostly just I've never looked at that. pen oh. and a little bit of color in between. And all the focus is really on the people and minimum on the surroundings around them. Yeah, and and the people are largely expressionless, so there's maybe a little smile here and there. Usually one line only. Yeah, and it's just, um, you know, people live in their life. It was a a lot more complex of a book than I thought when I was starting out. Oh, yeah, it totally is. I I read it twice this week and kind of had a different experience both times, which is why I recommend reading it at different points in your life. And the second time, I had this feeling like... I was part of their family almost, and they were talking about people that I should know already. Um, They mentioned this character, Dennis, and they were like, and they said, uh, and he kind of looks like Dennis, but we agreed not to talk about Dennis anymore. (laughs) And they they mentioned Dennis a little later, but I was like, oh, yeah, Dennis. Oh, oh, Dennis. Oh, we don't talk about Dennis. We don't talk about Dennis. Yeah, so (laughs) so this this is a book of an, it's like an experience, I, I really think. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, it was a nice surprise for me. How many hundreds would you give it? Four. Four. Point. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> oh suspense. No, straight four. It's I'll good. give it's good. 3.8. It, it's a bit rough at times, but it has really cool things going on. Mm-hmm. It's a cool book. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and honestly, if you do know Hungarian, pick it up in Hungarian. Because I think a little bit was lost in translation. 
to English. But not too much. Like, yeah, not too much. Still read it in English if you get a chance. Yeah. But. If you're fluent in Hungarian and English, feel free to read it in both languages. And yeah. uh, let us know. <laughs> oh let my us gosh. know where your translations differ. Please let me know. I would love to know if it's different. The Immortals Podcast <laughs> at gmail.com. <laughs> For our so many Hungarian listeners. <laughs> you don't know. Gotta have two. I, really at least two. Actually, I think I might know. Uh, there's, there's download data. <laughs> but let's finish up the podcast with. Another opera. We haven't had an opera since the very first episode. Yeah, wow. I mean, at this rate, that's 24% chance, 24 25% chance we'll get an opera. I'm glad he can do that, math. Yeah. Math is hard. Um, yeah, so I did the opera The Duena by Roberto Gerhard. Uh, Roberto Gerhard, born 1896, died 1970. He was uh, he's Catalan, born in Catalonia had to flee to France in 1939. Not really a good year to go to France, but no. he was also not really... He was, he was playing some pretty bad stuff himself. Catalonia had some pretty rough times with Franco. But eventually he found himself in England, and he composed there. Uh, grew up in a multilingual family. Half His dad was German-Swiss, his mom French-German. Anyway... Kind of explains why this opera is in English. Fun fact. Oh, it's weird to have yeah. an opera in English. It was. I was very surprised when it started. I was it like, "Wait, is this is this Latin or something? Why do I understand so many words?" <laughs> oh, <laughs> it is That's, though, right? It's Latin, ish, ish. Yeah, kind of. Except for the parts that aren't. But uh, <laughs> this started playing. And you thought, "Is this Latin?" Well, because I can't usually understand lyrics of operas in general. But, you know, you'll pick up a word or two if it's in Italian or French or... I'm with you. I'm with well, you. Have you. I get it. So yeah. I was like, oh. No, I heard... <laughs> Listen to the opera, guys. It's clearly an English sentence starting off. Oh, yeah. No, the, the first few... Yeah. It's, it's, it's in English. Um, but, full disclosure, I, I listened to this basically the entire time in the car. I did not understand half of the lyrics, so I don't really know what went on with the story. But this will sort of make up for my first opera, which I reviewed as basically a, a, a play, a film. Um, I have almost entirely just listening experience to this, and as a listening piece, it was kind of fun. Um, a lot of... I was really excited to know... I, I am really excited, curious to know what the story is about, because it sounds like a lot of good stuff is going on, like a lot of drama, uh, some some shadiness, maybe betrayal... Almost none of the pieces sounded like happy and jovial exclusively. They were all very dramatic and scandalous. And I think it takes place in Seville or Seville um, because they say that very often. And there's they, they make mention they make mention to a, a clever Portuguese, which I assume is a Portuguese man who is clever. Um, they talk about daughters, I think, and marrying. Apart from that, I'm not really sure what's what's going on. Did anyone else listen to this? I, I listened to it, and when I first read this in English, in the first sentence, <laughs> that I was saying, oh, I should really focus more, because it is it was a three-hour-long opera, and I, I've never... I mean, I'm very, very ignorant about operas. I've never actually attended an opera, and that's a, a giant artistic faux pas, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And so I was saying, okay, here, I'll do this. And... I don't think that's what a recording is supposed to be like. Just as... Hmm, it, it was... I think with opera, and I'm being extremely ignorant here, so everyone feel free to correct me, it, it's not exactly about every individual word. So when we mm-hmm. listen to an opera in Italian or in German, it's still about the experience. And when we're not native speakers of that, we can kind of just take it all in as... We know this long stretch of vowels means something um, to the emotional core of the story, but we don't need to know what every single word means. Well, it's- kind of. Um, like, because back in the day, you know, someone would be commissioned for an opera and they would take either a well known story or someone would come up with a story and then the composer would compose to it. And it would be a big deal. Like, that's the only show. No one would actually listen to a recording. They'd have to go and see the show and they would have a, a libretto with them. They would actually read and sort of know the story as it goes on. So this is definitely a sort of 
newer age way of listening to these sorts of things. I but so. I feel like I needed like I would definitely be able to follow the story easier with more mm-hmm. visuals because oh. I I was listening to it and I found that on archive.gov there actually is the old book that was used for one of the either the original I think it might be the original or the revival I forget the exact one mm-hmm. it was on there so I was reading it there is I can't reading this at the same time because it was at different spots of the story so I, I stopped that but when I stopped listening to the recording and was just reading the book it is written in in a very old time language as appropriate for mm-hmm. what it is and it did require a bit more focus on exactly what was going on just so what's it, what's it about well I didn't have time to read the whole <laughs> <laughs> well you, you started it out I, I, I read three pages uh, oh. and then saved it to look at later well, I, I got to like, you know, they curse this, damn this cursed string or something. They're talking about a bad a string or something, and then they talk about monks that are evil or coming in. Evil monks. Those are like sense. the first, the first like thirty seconds of the first track. Well, I felt there was also lots of fun gender plotting going on. It feels like, I think, someone was trying to woo one of the women, and then another guy was trying to woo one of the women, and the women were knowing about this because there was a very kind of fun song with two women talking about these guys that are after them and wow. that, then conflict is going on and then it's all resolved happen at the end. But mm-hmm. it was when I first listened to it before a single lyric happens, it was the most dynamic and fun classical recording we've heard so far. It was, I found the music to be very, very fun and clever and, and jovial. It was actually a really easy listen to. Mm-hmm. So it was no, smooth I, I, and consistent. I think it was a lot of fun to listen to, but again, like I feel like it was almost like I'm listening to a the soundtrack for a musical without knowing what the musical's about and only being able to understand like every fifth word, <laughs> which is I don't know. Uh, Sarah, you're you used to sing. Why yeah. do you guys oscillate intonations so widely when you vibrate? Your voices. That's a sentence. That's not a sentence. <laughs> is it, is it, is it, <laughs> is it just in opera? Is it only so that the vibrato doesn't go too fast? Because there's like oh, full wait, half okay, note I'm sorry. Ask this question in a way that makes sense. <laughs> okay. When you hear someone singing opera, okay. they, they, they use vibrato in mm-hmm. their voice, and the note oscillates like almost a half step down. And up, well, and I mean, that makes it really because, hard I mean, to understand what's happening. You, you mean you, there's there's a physics thing going on here, right? I mean, vibrato is is created by a change in the way that your vocal cords work, where you know. Oh yeah, I know. Flutter, so so obviously, like pitch is going to change as part of what vibrato yeah, is. No, that's yeah, that's that's what vibrato. I is. would it's argue, although I have not pitch. heard this recording, that if you're varying a half pitch in your vibrato, you're probably not very good at it. Okay, but, maybe it's not a half pitch but definitely like at least a quarter tone for a lot That's of still a lot That's really still wide a lot. um what I, I i'm not following this conversation at all okay but... you know when when someone sings like a high note they're not singing a flat pitch it's oscillating it's going oh, like at least often in opera it's not the only sure. way to sing but it is a way to sing that often comes with age and allows for greater projection mm-hmm I, I don't know. I mean, that, that just made it harder to understand. I'm wondering if there's... Yeah, it is. You know, it makes it very it. difficult. I mean, it's one of the reasons why vibrato is best suited for opera versus straight tone, which, like, I was a choral singer and a church oh, singer. Oh, yeah. We primarily use straight tone. In because the, you guys have to merge more. And... Well, first of all, for the purposes of harmony, but also yeah. because... It helps you understand what the heck is being said, which when you're in some sort of okay. prayerful state, for example, you actually want people to understand the words you're saying. Opera is more about the sort of washing over you, and vibrato is a soloistic kind of uh, kind of a virtuosic thing to do. Mm-hmm. And that's why I liked this opera more than the first opera we heard, because even though your description of the story was wonderfully insane, <laughs> the actual listening to it was, not that great. Was, oh, was not that impressive. It's kind of flat, yeah. With this one, I even though I couldn't always focus on the exact words that were being said, mm-hmm. um, because it's not intended that way. They're not speaking mm-hmm. like a person. They're going to have this word last for 30 seconds. Yeah. So I treated that as another instrument. 
Mm-hmm. No, and definitely. As, as a listening experience on the whole, this one was a lot better yeah, and it, enjoyable. You feel the emotion of the story arc, even though if you don't know what's going on. You can feel mm-hmm. it when it's more comical. You can feel it when it's more dramatic and more silly at times. You can feel that through the music and through the lyrics, even yeah, though you don't know the words. You can sort of... Yeah, that's I, that's that's what I liked about it, that even though I didn't know what was going on, I could still tell how I was supposed to feel and enjoy it that way. Which I think is, is the purpose of all classical recordings, if I understand. It's, it's to kind of have the emotions and appreciate beauty through a different medium. Oh, we'll find out. We have a lot more of these to do. <laughs> we will eventually learn how to review me. <laughs> eventually. We'll get to it. I, I really, uh, I found this to be very charming and fun, and the music just from the very first second, like, this was a, it, it was very exciting, and it was always yeah. really, I, I really enjoyed listening to I was I was never turned off by it, like, I was never, I would zone out here and there, sure, but I never listened, or I never got to a part where I thought, eh, can I can I change the station? What what am I listening it's to? It's one of our longest ones, and yet it was one it was of, long. Yeah, it was, it was two, for me. two and a half hours, but yeah. it didn't. Yeah, it didn't feel like it dragged out. I would love to see this live. Like I would love to see a very. I just def- it has these definite comical intentions going on. I would love to see mm-hmm. actors put this on with this I really excitingness. Definitely want to see this live. I think this is something that okay. When I said in the first podcast, this is something that was meant to be seen live and meant to be seen as a show. Uh, forget all about that. Don't, need, don't, don't don't even listen to our first, no listen. To, please listen to this but this yeah. one is definitely something that if you get a chance and it's playing in your local at your local symphony or opera house, you should definitely give it a watch because it sounded like a lot of fun just listening to it and. I imagine it would be a lot more seeing it and reading along with the story. And it's just called The Duena? Yes. Yeah. I, I looked it up, and actually I almost listened to the wrong thing, I guess, because um, when I looked up The Duena, I got some, I think, opera from before, way before uh, Roberto Gerhardt, and it was it's one of these things that, like, the original manuscripts don't survive or didn't survive or not all of it. So it's like one of those incompleted pieces. And I'm not sure if this takes after it or not, or it's just a separate thing, or maybe duena is a, a word that means something. Uh, sure and actually, I'd right imagine it does. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, the it's duenna. I, I'm not sure what duenna means. According to Google search, duenna means an older woman acting as a governess and a companion in charge of girls, especially in a Spanish family. Exactly. Nice. What do you mean? You didn't look up what the word meant of your, <laughs> of your assignment. <laughs> no, not, no, not at all. Uh, Andrew, I, I did I, your review three hinges. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I did exactly what I was supposed to and listened to it. Hopefully the old gods will understand. <laughs> But no, this was definitely a lot of fun, and I would probably listen to it again. Though I'd prefer watching it live. I agree. How many hinges would you give it? Hinge wise, I'd give this. Uh, I'd probably just give it a solid four. I'll go four point two. It, it was really four good. Point. It was most dynamic. It was consistently fun and energetic for an almost three hour run. That made it really compelling to listen to. I liked it. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. That's it. We did it. We did all of... Yay! Yay! <laughs> we finished all the 868th tasks for our insane podcast. Woo! I'm proud of us. We, I'm, we, I'm, 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 I'm proud, proud of us. We spent mostly... Mostly me. Well, I'm proud of me. <laughs> no, a, I'm proud of you guys. This is a very European podcast. It was, yeah. cause, Also, oh, wait it's a it's second. This is the second one in a row where we're reviewing a movie based in Chicago. That's Just true. Just to I think there's that a conspiracy is, yeah. happening here. And Sarah tried to bring up Ben Stein both weeks in a row. Ah, that's ah. true. And then the rest of this was set in Europe with the UK, Finland, Sweden, Hungary, oh, and uh, the UK <laughs> again. Good point. <laughs> Look at that geography. geography. I find that fascinating. I wonder what the next one's. <clears throat> oh, you're back. Guys. Hey! How's it going? Hey, can I tell you a secret, guys? Yeah, what's up? I love Space Jam. What the hell? Oh my god, really? Okay, okay. listen, awesome. listen, listen. I hate 
humans. Like, as a general rule, I hate Wait, you. but do you love the monsters? No, no, shh, shh, shh. <laughs> you guys suck. I can't tell you, I can't explain to you in words that are in English how much you guys just suck. Tell us in your native language, then. Yes. <laughs> It, you you honestly, you wouldn't understand it, and your ears would bleed by the end of it. Please so try. I, I'll spare, I will spare you that. Um, okay, coward. Anyway, Howard back at the office. I am not a coward. I know they call me a coward up there, but I'm oh, I'm not a coward. I, a I am not a coward. Intern. I don't think you're a coward. But I will tell you, there is one human in this entire world who I would say could maybe apply for an internship. He wouldn't get it, but he would apply, and he would not be laughed at, and that is Michael Jordan. Oh, that's yeah. definitely true. And that is Michael Jordan. Anyway, so that was the that was my favorite part of your podcast, was when you were talking about Space Jam. The one that had nothing to do with anything else. The first minute of our podcast. Space Jam yeah. has to do with everything. <laughs> and then I tuned out for the rest of it after that. You're probably not alone. It's fine. Mm. Well, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> Okay, so, okay. <laughs> Such confidence. Business now, business part of this, so that I can get home, get back to my family. Family? God. Yeah, I don't want to talk about it. Your ears will bleed. So, <laughs> your next number is... I'm sorry. That's that was, just you. I was just making, like, how, how are those thunder noises with coming? my voice, with Adam's inferior voice. The next number is 280. One. Ooh. Ooh. And Adam passed out again. 281, guys. Look up what that is. Yeah. 281. Let's see. 300. Oh, fine. I know what happens now. This is where we all look at the books. And 281. Ooh, I'm super excited about mine. It's mozzarella de bufala campana, which is the best food. Spoilers. That does sound pretty good. Sweet. That was a lot, a of, lot of words. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. You don't like it. It's tasty. The movie is Rebel Without a Cause. Ooh. Ooh. All right, nice. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Album is Let's Get It On by Marvin Gaye. Oh, yeah. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> a little spoiler on that album. <laughs> uh, my children's book is uh, John Brown, Rose, and Midnight Cat by the author Jenny Wagner. All right. Is or it Wagner or Wagner? I was just going to say. It's probably Wagner. Wagner. Ah. I don't know. I That's scratch. a next week job. Yeah, next week. I'll let you know next week. We'll figure it out. Good deal. Uh, my classical recording is String Quartet's Opus 44 by Felix Mendelssohn. Excited okay, about that. Know, look up what string and quartets mean. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> All right. And my TV show is, wow, I've actually never seen this show, The Incredible Hulk. Ooh, the 80s one? Yes. One That's of amazing. the best closing theme songs ever. All right. You know this. Yes. I, I don't think I've ever seen an episode of the show, but I just know that the closing theme song is amazing. I, I look forward to it. It's on Netflix. So yeah. Sweet. You should all watch it with me. Yeah. Maybe. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like my second tweet. <laughs> Eddie, you can catch us all next Thursday when we are going to review all of those things and go off on a couple of tangents as well. You can also, during that time, email us at theimmortalspodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear what you think about all the things we've discussed and any information you might have about them that we don't know. We'd love to hear from you. And also, you can follow us on Twitter at theimmortalspod. And you can see pictures of the food we're eating. You can have links to the operas we're listening to and many other things. Do you have pictures of our faces on there? Nope. Good. Yeah. Thank God. Until next week. <laughs> <laughs> so many pictures. And thank you all for listening. We'd love if you would give us a review on iTunes so more people can find us. And really, thank you all for listening so much. This is a lot of fun. My name is Austin. I'm Adam. I'm Sarah. I'm Lee. And I'm Pedro. Catch you all next week. Bye. I'd like to-